From the book of Ephesians this morning, chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. The book of Ephesians, chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. I have a young man that I've been mentoring, discipling for some time now. Um, for the sake of argument, I'll just call him Scott. That's not his real name, but we'll just call him Scott. One of the things I've been trying to teach Scott how to do is to share his faith, to share his testimony, what God has done in his life. And a few weeks ago, I took Scott out with me on a Thursday night, and I said, Scott, I've been working with him for a few months now. I said, Scott, tonight you're going to share your faith. And he said, cool. And when he got up to share his faith, he talked about having lived a wonderful life in sin. He used to go to all the parties. He used to do drugs. He used to smoke and, do, and drink alcohol. Uh, he had a wonderful life of sin. Then he said, one day I got saved. And oh, what a difference Jesus has made in my life. All the joy and peace that he's bought me. You see, when he was talking about his past life, he talked about living a wonderful life in sin. But somehow, when he talked about the Christian life, becoming a believer, it was almost like a total letdown. That it's it's boring. It's a second class to what he had experienced. And I said to him afterwards, I said, dear brother, we need to flip the energy and the enthusiasm around on that testimony. Because when you were living in your past, you were dead. But thank God in Christ, you have been made alive. And maybe I'm talking to someone here at Calvary Chapel this morning. Maybe you thought in your past life, man, I really had a great time. I had lots of friends. I, I, I was the life of the party. And somehow you feel like the Christian life is a letdown. And I just want to remind you today <coughs> from God's word that the Christian life is not a letdown. Matter of fact, he raises us up. He places us in new places. A a a amen? amen? If you think your past life is more exciting than the life you have now, maybe you either need to go deeper or you need to get on board what Christ is doing right now. Matter of fact, this text proves what I'm saying. I think it's a portrait of the Christian life. It reminds me that Paul says in verse 1, and you were dead in your trespasses and sin. Um, how much worse can it get? I call this, in verses 1, 2, and 3, the coroner's report. He said you were dead. What does dead mean? Capital D, capital E, capital A, dead. Flat line. In other words, you could not respond to God. And even if you could, you wouldn't. Because you are dead, I tell you. It's almost like hooking every spiritual machine up to you. You're dead, unable to respond to God. And of course, in verse 2, it says, in which you formerly walked, <coughs> according to the course of this world, according to the prince of power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Not only were you dead in verse 1, but closely related, and it gets worse, you were disobedient. Um, you walked with the one of this world. You're not only dead, but you're disobedient. It's like walking in the total opposite direction from God. Because you walk according to the course of this world, according to the prince of power, which is the evil one, Satan, of the air, 
of the Spirit that is now working in the sons, and if you allow me to say this, and daughters of disobedience. Um, brothers and sisters, uh, the corner says not only are you dead, but even what makes matters worse, you are disobedient. And I was telling my disciple, I said, you got to look at this again. When you thought you were partying and having fun, you were really dead. You were really empty. And you know what he said to me? He said, you know, you're right. Every party I've ever left, I left empty. Every time I took drugs, it left me empty. Every time I got drunk, it left me empty. Verse 3. It says, among them, you too all formerly live in the lust of our flesh, indulging, in, uh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and whereby nature children of wrath, even as the rest. <coughs> Brothers and sisters, not only were we dead, not only were we disobedient, but thirdly here, the coroner's report tells us that we were depraved and we were also headed for certain doom. It doesn't get any worse than that. Matter of fact, someone just asked me the other day, what does this whole idea of depravity mean? Is it, is it depraved or depravity? Is it total depravity? They told me they were confused and I told them I was too. All I know is that every aspect of us Every aspect of our being has been tainted by sin. Well, I like coffee in the morning. Anybody else drink coffee in the morning? Wait a minute. No, I'm sorry. I don't really like coffee. I like creamer, and I like coffee with my... <laughs> Am I at the right church now? I thought I was at the wrong church just for a moment there. I like, I like coffee in my creamer. And a matter of fact, um, the one that I like is the one that the angels use in heaven. It's called French vanilla. Yes, I, I love myself some French vanilla, and I, 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 most of the time I put my French vanilla in the coffee cup first, then I add a little coffee to it, and I drink it strong with my French vanilla in there, and I love it. <clears throat> Just the other day, I made me a cup of um, um, a French vanilla creamer with my coffee in it, and it was divine. I promise you it was. But I let it sit too long, and I need to refresh it, and I put some more coffee in it, and I notice, without even adding any more fresh vanilla to it, it was, it was still righteous. It was still right. I said, praise the Lord for coffee creamer. <laughs> you see, once you add coffee creamer to your coffee, it can never go back to just being coffee. It is coffee with coffee creamer. It is coffee with French vanilla in it. When our grandparents, Adam and Eve, sinned, when sin entered to our flesh, we can no longer say we're just human. Now we're human with a fallen nature. We're human with a sin nature. We're, we're, we're depraved now. Every aspect of us, my mind is depraved. My, my, I have a bottle of water. Thank you, dear brother. No, sir, I have one. Thank you. Um, but hold that one for me until after church. I may drink it then. Um, every aspect is depraved. Our mind is depraved. Our heart is depraved. Our will is depraved. Our body is depraved. Every aspect of our being is depraved. Just like the coffee creamer taints the coffee, sin has tainted every aspect of our lives. And then to make matters worse, we're doomed. It says in that last section there, we were, were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. You see the coroner's report? I was telling my mentee, Scott, I said we were born dead, unable to respond, respond to God. We were born disobedient. And if any of you have kids, you know kids are born disobedient. I love to blame my wife for it, but I still look at the man in the mirror. We were born depraved already with a sin nature. 
and lo and behold, we were born doomed. I don't know about you, brothers and sisters, nothing get any worse than that. Dead is enough for me. But when you add disobedient, when you, when you add depraved, every part of me, even when I want to do good stuff, evil is right there, present. And not only that, I was doomed. But verse 4 gives me the good news, but God. Okay, I'm at the wrong church. <coughs> but God. Okay, let me try this side out. That's that side. But God. I like this side better already. But God. Being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us. You see, the first section is the coroner's report. But verses 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9 is Christ to the rescue. And what do we have when Christ comes to our rescue? First of all, we experience the love of God. But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love, which he loved us. When I was a kid in vacation Bible school, I learned this verse. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believe in him shall not perish but have. Y'all must have been at the same vacation Bible school. Um. Uh, Romans chapter 5 verse 8 says he demonstrated his love for us. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He loves us, brothers and sisters. He loves you this morning. And God showers us, I, I love what this text said, with his rich mercy, with his everlasting, consistent, rich mercy, we experience the love of God. <coughs> Even though we were dead, disobedient, depraved, doomed, worthless, he loved us. And not only that, in verse 8, he says, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. He, he, I love what the King James says here. King James says he quickens us. He makes us alive. He put newness of life in us. I like what the scripture says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ Jesus, he's a new creation. Old things are passed away, and behold, all things have been made new. <clears throat> and you have to notice the building block here in verse 4. He said he loves us. Verse, verse 5, he, he says it like this. He, he made us alive together. By grace, you have been saved. I woke up this morning thanking God I'm saved. I'm on my way to heaven. Anybody glad that you're on your way to heaven this morning? That you're saved this morning? You don't just have insurance, but you have assurance, blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. For so many people, they have fire insurance, but no blessed assurance. I'm saved today. I experienced the love of God. He loves me. He saved me. And I get up with that joy every day of the week. Even though I was born disobedient. I was born dead. Even though I was born, everything I thought of, I was going to do right, I did wrong. But God loved me through all of that. You know, as I look at this, it just keeps on building. It gets better and better. Not only do we experience his rich mercy and his love. Verse 4. Verse 5 says, um, <coughs> he quickens us. He, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved through faith. Verse 6, at just the beginning there, he raised us up with him. He, he raised us up. Um, 
uh, he's not just referring to Christ physically. He's referring, referring to us spiritually. He raised us up in him. It can't get any better than that. And then, if that's not enough, not only does he love us, not only does he make us alive, and he, and, and, and according to verse 6, he raised us up and seated us with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Christ came to our rescue when I was a rich undone. I was on my way to hell. By this point in our conversation, we were, we were, me and Scott, we were in a Starbucks, and he said, I got my testimony wrong, didn't I? I said, yes, you did. Because over here, you said how wonderful your life was. But over here, you said, since I've been saved, what a joy and peace has been. I said, brother, your testimony should have been when I was dead when I was disobedient, far away from God, when I was depraved and doomed, I had no hope, no joy, no peace, no security. But the day I found Christ, the day Christ found me, what a difference Christ has made in my life. I have joy now. I have peace. He's, he's made me alive. I experienced the love of God. He's raised me. And I'm sitting in heavenly places with him. Is that your testimony this morning? That Christ has made a difference in my family? My father, I was born in 1973. My father came to know Jesus as Lord and Savior of his life in 1978. And I can still remember the night under that tent revival that my father gave his life to Christ. He had a pocket full of cigarettes, a cabinet full of liquor at home, but something got a hold on my daddy, and he couldn't shake it off. And I remember he got to the altar that night, and he emptied his pockets of his cigarettes, and he told, us, told our pastor, he said, I want to be saved. And our pastor prayed with him, and my daddy gave his heart to Christ that night. He said, I got to be baptized. The pastor snatched off his robe. He said, put on my robe. We're going to baptize you right now. When my daddy got home that night, cabinet full of liquor, he poured all of that junk down the drain. He said, because God has changed my life. And I realize some people are saved and they're still smoking. And some people are saved and they're still drinking. But there was a difference God made in my daddy's life that night. And, you know, I sat there as a little boy watching my dad. And not only was God changing his life, but the Lord was also changing my life too. And the life of my brother and the life of my mom. God was turning our family around. Christ came to our rescue, I tell you. I've thought many of days, where would I be without Jesus in my life? I'd have been dead a long time ago. Does anybody know that? Without Christ in my life today, I've been married this coming May for 22 years. I'd have been divorced a long time ago. But the difference Jesus has made in my life. And you know what? I know he's not just making the difference in my life. I know he's making a difference in your life as well. When Christ gets a hold to your life, all the grace, all the joy, all the satisfaction and security, and here's the richness of his grace. <coughs> this is where all of this comes together. He says in verse 7, so that in ages to come, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. You know, the Bible tells us he made him who knew no sin to become sin for us, that we may become the righteousness of Christ in him. In other words, he made someone die for our sins. He poured our sins on his son so he could be kind 
toward us. And I thank God for his kindness that he has shown me. I was in a restaurant the other day, and my daughter and I were sitting there. It was her 20th birthday, and she wanted to go to a nice restaurant in town. <coughs> Plus, she wanted to look at a, um, the Duke team. I think they're called the, the Blue Devils, Duke Blue Devils. So we went down there to see could we get a glimpse of glory. I mean, glimpse of the Blue, Blue Devils. And... Um, eat at this nice steakhouse, which we did. And, and we, we saw Zion while we were sitting there. It, it was glorious. I mean, it was an honor to just to be in the room. And some of the parents from the Duke squad were conversing with us. And we were just having a great old time. My daughter enjoyed it. She said, Dad, the only thing that would be better than this meal if you would buy me tickets to the basketball game. I said, keep praying. I'm a Baptist preacher. Y'all ain't praying with me this morning. And we were sitting there just conversing. We, we had some dessert, had our after-dinner coffee, and it was time to go. And I know those folks was moving slow as it relates to the check. And finally, I asked the server, I said, um, check, please. And they said, um, your check has been taken care of. And I said, who did it? And they said, they told me not to tell you. But they just told me to tell you that they wanted to show some kindness toward you. I almost got up and shouted right there in the uh, restaurant. That someone would be so kind to take care of my check. Y'all ain't praying with me. If I'm willing to shout over someone paying for my lunch at a nice restaurant, how much more should I shout when it comes to my Lord and his kindness that he has shown me? He's been kind in his grace. Matter of fact, if you look at the verse carefully, so that in ages to come, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and, and, and kindness toward us. We're still benefits. We're still benefiting from that kindness. Then if, if you think that's good, you should see verses 8, 9, and 10 when it just really gets into it. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And not of, not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. <clears throat> when I read verse 8, Christ has really come to my rescue. Because someone asked me just a few years ago, do I have to do something to earn my salvation? To gain my salvation? I said, no, it's, it's just by faith. You receive it. This grace has been given to you through faith. They said, that doesn't seem right, that Christ did all the work and I get all the benefit. But I said, that's the name of it this morning. You get God's grace through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. One of my friend's daughter is getting married soon. And... um. Her fiance decided to take her parents out. And they were in this restaurant and they were eating together. And this young man had saved up his pennies in order to impress her father. So when the check came, the young man said, I'll pay for it. And the father said, No. Well, he said, Sir, he said, I've been saving up for this moment. And I really want to be a blessing to you and your family. He said, Son, no. I got the check. <clears throat> the young man seemed deflated, seemed kind of bothered. I would have said praise the Lord. But anyway, he seemed a little bothered, a little deflated by it, came up with something else. He said, well, if you're going to take care of the check, can I at least take care of the tip? And the father said, if I won't let you take care of the check, you can't take care of the tip either. Brothers and sisters, this is such a gift from God. He doesn't let us pick up the check, nor does he ask us for the tip. Because Jesus paid it all. And all to him I owe. Sin has left the crimson stain. But he's washed us white as snow. Do you believe that today? 
Do you believe that Christ paid it all day? That's the riches of his grace. But he doesn't let us pick up the check. Nor does he ask us. But, but Lord, I was so disobedient. He says, I know. That's why I loved you and raised you and quickened you. That's why I put you in heavenly places. That's why I, I gave you my incomparable, lavished you with my grace. And if it doesn't get any better than that, he says, verse 9, not as a result of works that no one may boast. As we sit here today, no one can boast. And say, look what I did. I saved me. No, no, you can't save you. Well, it's my family name. No, 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 no. It's, it's how much money? No, mm -mm. I'm glad it's not how much money you make. But anyway, it's, it's nothing that you can do to earn this. No one can boast about this because Jesus did it all. That's the richness of his grace. And I know you sit there and stretch your head today. What can I do? Just accept it. The coroner's report is that we were dead, depraved, disobedient, and doomed. But when Christ came to our rescue, thank God that he loved us. He made us alive. He raised us. He he, he, he placed us in the heavenly places. He lavished his grace on us. Thank you that through faith I have all of this, the richness of his grace. So, so what should be the Christian response? I, I'm, I'm glad y'all asked. How should I respond to all of this? Scott asked me, he said, how do I respond to how much I said, well, Scott, you don't respond to it by saying I had a wonderful life of sin and then one day Jesus came into my life. You say, I was miserable over here. So when you get over here, you can give God all the glory, honor, and praise. So what should be my response? Verse 10 gives me the proper response. <coughs> For we are his workmanship. Creating in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. I think this should be our response. We need to realize that we're his workmanship. In the Greek here, this word is called poinos. It's like we're his poem in process. We are his workmanship. God is still working on me. And I'm not the only one God is still working on. God is still working on you as well. God is working on us. Created in Christ Jesus for good works. For good stuff. You need to say, Lord, do something in me so you can do something through me. I told Scott, I said, Scott, for those who are dead, they need God to do something in them in order to do something through them. For those who are depraved, for those who are disobedient, Lord, do something in them in order to do something through them. Lord, Lord, love them so much. Raise them up. Lavish them with your, 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 your grace. Pour it out on them, Lord. So that they'll realize they're created in Christ Jesus for good works. <clears throat> Which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. I think verse 10 gives us a preview for the rest of Ephesians. Because the first three chapters in Ephesians gives us the proper theology but chapters 4, 5, and 6 gives us the proper practice that we may walk in good, good works, good stuff. We realize there's some things that we need to take off. And we realize there's some things that we need to put on. So this morning, what's the, what's the coroner's report? We're pretty flatlined. 
dead, I tell you. But Christ came to the rescue. And let me just make sure I clear a little issue up before I let you go. It doesn't happen automatically. It's only when you receive it by faith. It's only when you place your trust in Christ. You allow Christ to come to your rescue and do a work in you in order to do a work through you. And then you can have the proper response. Lord, I'm your poinos. You're the potter. I'm the clay. Do with my life what you will, Lord. I, I know you created this stuff, me for good works, even before I was born. Lord, do your work in me. And with that kind of available heart, God comes alongside you, and not only does he do it in you and through you, but God will take you places that you never thought you'd go and help you do some incredible things by faith that you thought you'd never do. Do you believe that this morning? Let me pray for us. Father, I pray for that person this morning who thought they had a wonderful life of sin before coming to know you. But I haven't take the t taken the time to investigate the riches of your grace. Don't know how amazing your grace is. Thank you for the songwriter who says, Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved the wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I was found blind, but now I see. Thank you for that this morning. And God, I do pray for my Calvary Chapel family that you would speak to each and every last one of us and help us to remember before you, we were dead. That's the coroner's report. But Christ came to our rescue. That's your grace. And what should be our response to allow you to work in our lives? This is your servant's prayer now. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen.